All right, so we're going to start with the ABCs of salvation like we usually do. Uh, the ABCs of salvation, this is not a formula. Salvation, salvation isn't a formula. Salvation is simply trusting in Jesus and his finished work on the cross, that he is God, he is capable of saving us, and he came and he took our sin on himself. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us. And when we put our trust in him, then we become the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. And so everyone sinned. No one is perfect. No one is good enough to receive salvation. Uh, you have to be perfect. And the only one that's ever lived the sinless life, the only one that's ever been perfect is Jesus. And so we put our trust in him. And that is believing on him is simply trusting in him. It's not just believing that he is, but it is putting your trust in him. And that is how we receive salvation. And when you, when you have received salvation, when you know Jesus, then you want to work for him. Now, when you love someone, you want to bless them. You want to please them. You want to make them smile. And so when someone knows Jesus, they want to make him smile. They're not working for their salvation. They are working because they're saved. And so we are looking forward to the soon return of Jesus. And there is a lot of talk right now about a Revelation 12 sign. And uh, Revelation 12 is a vignette in the book of Revelation. And so we're going to unpack that a little bit. But there is um, a sign that occurs uh, really every year around the Feast of Trumpets that has hints of this Revelation 12 sign. In 2017, uh, we uh, we saw the sign. Many people got very excited. It was something that woke up a lot of watcher watch watchmen and women. And now this year on the Feast of Trumpets, the sign is really it's a neon sign screaming, unlike anything we've ever seen before. And it's very very interesting. But what I want to focus on tonight is what the book of Revelation is actually saying about Revelation 12, what God wants us to understand about what this picture is that he's put in the sky and what this picture is, what it tells us about the time of, um, of the tribulation. And so here, although Revelation 12 is found in the middle of, book, of the book of Revelation, and this actually threw me years ago. This threw me. I um, I I did not understand <laughs> that even though the Book of Revelation is somewhat chronological, um, it also has it also has vignettes inside of it. So there is a chronological order to Revelation, but Revelation twelve is not a middle tribulation chapter. Revelation twelve is a vignette, and when we look at this, it's a short scene that describes uh, a bigger event that happens. So if you look at the, if you look at Revelation 12, and we're going to unpack it in, in just a little bit, you're actually seeing a picture from Israel's perspective, mostly of the entire tribulation from the rapture all the way through to Jesus's second coming. And you can find all of that in the book of um, it in Revelation 12. And so it's not talking about one particular little moment. It's actually spanning um, at least seven years. So we're going to unpack that a little bit more. But uh, it, it's a fascinating picture, it's something that Jesus uh, does want us to understand. Everything in scripture is something that he wants us to understand. But before we get into specifically unpacking Revelation 12, I want to help make the case of why this woman in labor is has a lot to do with the rapture of the church. Why this is a picture of what's about to happen to us. So labor pains are pains 
that are used throughout scripture as a picture of the last days. Uh, from the Old Testament and the New Testament, you have this imagery of birth pains pointing to the day of the Lord. And so this isn't just found in Revelation 12. It's found throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And Jesus even himself said these are birth pains. So why does God use this imagery, this birth imagery, to refer to his return? And so number one, labor pains are pains with a purpose. So labor pains, as, as much as they hurt, <laughs> they are joyful. And that's, that's an interesting thing right now, because we that know Jesus, as we see these labor pains, you know, I keep saying bittersweet more and more. I find myself saying bittersweet, but that's because these pains are bittersweet. We understand the severity of what's happening. And the longer we're here, the more severe these birth pains are going to get until he comes and gets us. But at the same time, labor pains are pains with a purpose. Pains that are welcome because we know that when they find their result, their result is the baby being born. Their result is the rapture of the church. And so as the pain, as the pain increases, as the birth approaches, the pains will increase in strength and, fre and frequency. So we know that the signs of the end, we know the world around us is going to get crazier it's going to get harder and these birth pains are going to get closer together and more severe uh, you don't have to be a prophet to know that all you have to do is read your bible and you know these birth pains that's why in the past three and a half years things have been getting crazy they've been getting crazier things have been getting harder and it and uh to where there's a new you know the new phrase or, or the new um term coined uh, by the uh, the UN is polycrisis because we have one crisis happening on top of another crisis and uh, we should be used to that because it's going to continue like that until Jesus returns. So a mother does not know the day or hour that the child will come, but she knows when the birth is soon and she knows when the birth is soon because of the birth pains, because of their frequency. And it's also anticipation and it's hope. As you feel those pains, your anticipation and your hope increases. It doesn't take away from how painful it is, but you know that these, again, are pains for a purpose. And Jesus compared salvation to being born again. And so we see this picture of birth pains equaling the day of the Lord and salvation being born again. So there's all this birth analogy going on. And so this is, of course, where Jesus mentioned that when Nicodemus came to him. And so he came to him at night and he asked Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher. It's come from God for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with them. And Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. And so in order to see the kingdom of God, we have to be changed. We have to be born again. Because this corruptible can't enter the kingdom of God. In our corruptible state, in our corrupted state, we cannot tolerate the presence of God. We have to be changed. And so Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. At the rapture, we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. At our birth, we'll be changed. The baby is born 
and we're going to become something very different than what we are now. So when does this happen? When we're born again, we become a new creature. When we're born again, um, we're, we're going to have that incorruptible, the immortal that um, is planted inside of us is, is going to take root. Just like, you know, Jesus described it as a seed to where what, what's planted, you don't, you don't fully understand what it is. A small little seed becomes this huge, beautiful tree. And you wouldn't be able to figure out what it's going to look like and what it really is after it sprouts by the seed. And, and it's really similar with us. You, you don't fully understand what we are by the seed. But one day that seed is going to sprout. I believe that's the rapture when we put on our immortality. So we're now being prepared to enter the kingdom. And we are awaiting the redemption of our bodies. Second, Second Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And so we are a new creature. When we receive Jesus as our Savior, we become something different. Romans 8, 23. And not only that, but we ourselves who have the spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So in this same area, this same um, part of Romans, it's talking about all creation is groaning. And we also are groaning because we are awaiting the rapture, the redemption of our bodies. That first fruit that has been planted inside of us. In Galatians 4, 6 through 7. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. And so we have become heirs because of Christ, because of we, what he did. We can cry out to God. We can call him our dad. And so we're awaiting that day of redemption. And just like a baby inside the womb, we have no idea the wonders that await us. You know, that baby inside the womb, it, they just, all that they have is, is that immediate little area around them. They feel the warmth. They can hear the sound of their parents. But their understanding of the world after birth is so limited. And in a lot of ways, we're like that. Our understanding, we can hear God's voice. And we have somewhat of an understanding of, to him. But in no way compares to what we're about to know. When we're born and we see him face to face. And so we are, when we are born into the redeemed bodies on that great day, when we receive Jesus, we are sealed for the day of redemption. So we've been sealed. Um, <clears throat> Ephesians 4.30 tells us to don't grieve the Holy Spirit because you've been sealed. He is in you and he has sealed you. And the Holy Spirit will keep us until the day of redemption, until the rapture when he hands us to God. And so we have been sealed um, until that, until we're delivered to Jesus. First Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will ever be with the Lord. And so this is that moment where the dead in Christ will rise first and then we will meet them in the air. And so these birth pains of the end, this is the, this is the resurrection and it's the birth of something new. So Jesus referred to salvation as being born again. And he also referred to the signs of the end of the age as these birth pains. So there's this connection here between the end of the age and this end of the age of grace that we're in right now and the day of the Lord, all of this is connected. And uh, so Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, when his disciples came to him and asked him, what, what are the, what's the sign 
of the coming of the end of the age? What is the sign of your return? And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. And we talk about this a lot too. Number one, don't be deceived. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and they'll lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed. For this, mu for this must take place, but the end is not yet. See, God is not freaking out by the birth pains. He's not worried by the things that we see happening in the world. He knows that they must take place first. For this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there'll be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all these are but the beginning of the birth pains. And so all these things are the beginning of those pains. And these are pre-tribulation birth pains. Uh, here we see in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, while people are saying peace and security, and we know we've got peace and security all over everything that the UN ever does. <laughs> you know, The United Nations, everything that they do, they seem to have peace and security at the bottom, mixed in, you know, speeches, count how many times they say peace and security and um, in a speech, it's ridiculous. So while they are saying peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as what? As labor pains come upon a pregnant woman. Again, this imagery of these things being labor pains, getting ready for the birth, and they will not escape. Now we know First Thessalonians continues to go on and says that we will not be caught off guard by that day because we're not in darkness. And so there's this separation between those that will go into the tribulation and those that are raptured um, in those birth actually happening. So Romans 8 here, 22, 22 through 23, for we know that whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And we can, you know, we can see this. And, and right now, that's one of the that's one of the things that the enemy is using is this climate change. And, and it's really a, a climate change um, religion. And it's going to be part of what is used during the tribulation to to control everyone. And so. What the enemy, the enemy knew that this would happen because God said it would happen. So what God what God tells us is that during the tribulation and leading up to the tribulation, nature all creation is groaning in birth pains the bible does talk about about climate change but it calls it birth pains it calls it the tribulation period and not only the creation but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly we, we just went over this we groan inwardly as we eagerly await for the adoption of the sons the redemption of our bodies as we wait for that birth the rapture and so this leads us to the birth in revelation 12 where we see this vignette we see this little this little snippet that takes you all the way through the tribulation period really with the center character being Israel, being the woman. And so there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. And she began and she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Now this right here is a picture of this beast government. This is the same beast that you see in the book of Daniel. This is the same beast that you see um, later in Revelation coming, coming out of the water. This is that beast government that will hand its power over to the Antichrist. So we see this beast here. We see here, this is Satan himself, this government that he forms. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon 
stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up, that is the same word, harpazo, raptured, unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, but she, where she had a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there for a thousand, two hundred, and three score days. So the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. So here we see the woman, which is the nation of Israel, gives birth to the church. Revelation, um, Jesus says in Revelation 2, 26, that those that overcome, that we will rule with a rod of iron. And here, this is the child that will rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And so we are the body of Christ. And so here we see we will rule and reign with him during the millennial reign. And this child is caught up. Understand Jesus was not caught up. Jesus ascended, but he was not raptured. He was not grabbed in haste. And see, there is something going on that we don't even see right now. We we see the Red Sea moment coming together. We see the enemy um, putting all his all his uh, plans in place. We see him setting up his government. We see him getting ready for the tribulation period. But when this happens, we're going to be snatched out on a rescue mission. Exactly why we're being snatched out in such a hurry, we don't know yet. But he snatches us out in a rescue mission. And so we'll be caught up or raptured before the beginning of this seven years officially starts. So in Revelation 12, you see a time spanning of over seven years. We see her in labor that's set up to the tribulation period. We see the rapture. And then we see her fleeing into the wilderness and being taken care of for the first three and a half years. And then later we'll see what happens to the remainder of the time. The woman Israel runs into the wilderness where God takes care of her. Now, this could be um, the first three and a half years of the tribulation, 1260 days of the tribulation. And Israel will have this false sense of security during this time. She's been gathered back to her nation since 1948. And during this first three and a half years, she's going to feel like, okay, have her temple. You know, they're planning to sacrifice the red heifers come Passover 2024. And so the third temple, reinstating the sacrifices, all these wars are set to happen. Everything, everything is set to happen. Everything is holding. I believe it's all holding for the rapture. I think while the restrainers here, the floodgates can't burst through. And so everything is ready and holding and it's just about to burst. I don't think it fully can until we're gone. And so all the enemies of Israel are perched and ready to go. And there's just something keeping them from going right into these end time wars that we see um, Psalm 83 and Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, it seems like they're just on hold. And so the woman Israel here has this first three and a half years where she's being taken care of in her land. And so then Revelation 12 um, continues. There appeared, um, oh, well, first I wanted to show you guys this, the actual Revelation sign um, around Rosh Hashanah, around the Feast of Trumpets this year, because this is really interesting. This has never happened before. And this is very interesting what, what is happening this year. And this is right on Rosh Hashanah. So the actual sign in the sky is a woman with the sun. Um, she's clothed in the sun. It's right there uh, clothing her. The moon is actually down here by her feet. And what's interesting is because this year at Rosh Hashanah, there's an asteroid called, literally called Child that is in her womb. And there's another asteroid called United Nations that's right there. 
And they both exit her wound right on um, the Feast of Trumpets time, which is very interesting. And there is, um, uh, there's a brother Patrick who has done, um, I believe it's Hourly Watch. He has done, oh, just scores, scores of research. And basically it's like a neon sign of, so many details but I think it's very interesting that here we have literally child in the womb of the woman and everything is set up exactly um this feast of trumpets right as a time where the United Nations is saying that they're going to sign uh that they are going to confirm a covenant with many for seven years uh, the 2030 agenda and they keep saying that they need to do this and strengthen it for the next 70 for the next seven years in order to to meet the 2030 um, goals so it's very interesting this this um, feast of trumpets is definitely one to be on alert and watching because uh, there's there's lots of lots of setting up going on and so uh, continuing here with revelation 12 13. And so we have the woman here. She is with child. She's in, she delivers the child. She runs into the desert. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth and see Satan, there's this battle in heaven. And he is, his time is short and he's cast to the earth along with his fallen angels. And so Satan persecutes the woman. He persecutes Israel. And see, that's what we see. Tribulation period, this is the time of Jacob's trouble. The tribulation does not have anything to do with the church. We are with Jesus in our wedding ceremony, our seven-day or seven-year wedding ceremony. That's what we're doing during the tribulation period. Uh, the tribulation is Jacob's trouble. This is that last week of Daniel 70 weeks that God promised he would put an end to all of this and restore Israel to himself. And so here, the enemy, um, Satan, persecutes the woman, which brought forth the male child. And the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. Now, this is the same terminology we see from Egypt, um, from Exodus, where God brought Israel out of Egypt with wings of a great eagle. So this is referencing God's power that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. So we see the first three and a half years. There's a first three and a half years where she is fed and protected. And then there is the second three and a half years where she runs and God protects her from Satan during that last three and a half years. And so, um, and Jesus refers to this. We'll get to that in just a minute. And so the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away in the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed. So here the enemy during the tribulation, he's going to go after Israel, but the remnant of Israel during the second half of the tribulation will run to Petra, to a place, um, uh, many people believe it's Petra, to a place where God has prepared for them to protect them from Satan. So then he's going to go after the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So then he goes after the tribulation points. And that's where we see the mark of the beast is implemented. Those that do not have the mark of the beast cannot buy or sell. There's beheading. The enemy will go after those saints, the tribulation saints, because he can't get the church. Uh, the church is already with God. He can't get Israel. It, God has Israel hidden and protected. So he goes after the tribulation saints during the last three and a half years. And, um, and so here we see the dragon, Satan, takes over the Antichrist for the last three and a half years. Um, and he causes the abomination that causes desolation. 
Remember at the three and a half year mark, the Antichrist goes into the third temple that's that has been rebuilt. He stops the sacrifices and he goes into the Holy of Holies and he says he's God. And that starts this wrath of God on the earth, because here we have Satan himself claiming to be God and the masses of the people receive Satan saying he's God to where they have rejected God almighty. And so there is this wrath um, that is poured out on the planet. So here Jesus mentioned this time in Matthew 24. Jesus said, said, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, then those, then let those who, who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And so Jesus is referencing what Daniel wrote about the this, um, this midpoint time. And here we see the woman fleeing to the wilderness. They're going to take Jesus's advice. They're going to do what Jesus told them to do. At this point, they're realizing that Jesus is God, that Jesus is their Messiah after all. So we see Revelation 12 here spans the entire tribulation period from the rapture of the church through the first three and a half years and the second three and a half years. And, um, this isn't just unique to Revelation. We see this the, this image and this picture all throughout the Old Testament as well. So Isaiah 66 also records Israel travailing in the last days. And this is right before the Messiah reigns. Before she, Israel, travailed, that's birth pain. Before she gave birth, she brought forth. Before her pain came, before Jacob's trouble, she delivered a man-child, the rapture, before the tribulation. Who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? See, we saw the nation Israel being born in one day in 1948. But the earth bringing forth, you think about this, this is, this is the day, the rapture is the day that the dead in Christ are raised all over the planet. There's this giant birth all over the planet of those that are dead in Christ and then those that are alive in Christ in one day. For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to birth and not cause to bring forth, says the Lord. Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, says thy God. And so, no, God is going to, this baby is going to be born. <laughs> you know, this baby is going to be born. One day, the rapture will happen. We'll be face to face with Jesus. And then here we see, before Israel's birth pain, she gives birth to a male child. The church is the body of Christ. Before Jacob's trouble, and this is Jeremiah 37, alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. That final week, the tribulation week. So Jesus said at the beginning of the birth pains to look up because our redemption draws near. At the beginning of the birth pains, the church is raptured. And Israel is then saved through the tribulation. God protects her through the tribulation. Or he protects a remnant through the tribulation. So we have been, this is Isaiah 26, 18 through 21. We have been with child. This is from Israel's perspective again. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. That doesn't sound like the rapture. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise, awake and sing. Ye that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. 
Come, my people, enter in thy chambers and shut the doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, for behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitant, the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. And so see here we have this picture here of the rapture of bringing forth wind as this birth and the dead no longer being covered, the dead rising and the Lord coming out of his chamber to punish the inhabitants of the earth during this tribulation time. And then Micah foretells Jesus being here, Micah um, foretells that Jesus is born in Bethlehem and a time after birth where the rest of Israel will return and the Messiah will shepherd his flock. But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor, Israel, has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And see, when Jesus was here, when Jesus was here, when he was walking um, the earth, Israel, it was Judah that had returned to Israel. You know, we call um, those, those in Israel Jews. Well, Jews really are just from the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, because that had that those are who returned after the Babylonian exile to Jerusalem. But the other 10 tribes had gotten lost until these last days. Since 1948, all of Israel, not just Judah, but all of Israel has returned. And that right here is, is what... Um, is what Micah is talking about. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time that she is in labor has given birth. And then we see the rest of his brothers shall return the people of Israel and he shall stand and shepherd his flock and strength of the Lord. And so we see this even after the tribulation period where God is completely restoring all 12 tribes of Israel. He is restoring his nation and his people. And he will be their shepherd in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, and they shall dwell secure for now. He shall be great to the ends of the earth and he shall be their peace. And so here we have Jesus as king of kings and going into the millennial reign of Christ. So the age of grace, the Gentiles mentioned here, he shall give them up until the time when she who's in labor has given birth. Israel is the one who's in labor, and she's been in labor since since Pentecost. She's been forming. She's been pregnant since been, since Pentecost. Pentecost was the beginning of the church. We have been growing and forming. This baby has been growing and forming for two thousand years, and Israel is the one who's in labor. So God knew Messiah would be cut off. Just as Daniel prophesied that Israel would be blind in part until the fullness, um, Israel would be fly, blinded in part until the fullness of the Gentiles. That um, Paul that said that in Romans 11. When the fullness is accomplished and Israel gives, gives birth to the church who is raptured away, then God's full focus is back on Israel for the final seven years. So, this baby has been forming for 2000 years and Israel has been in partial blindness until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And when that happens, God's full focus is completely back on Israel. And we can see that happening now because Israel is back in her land. They are awaiting their Messiah. They, their, their rabbis are saying their Messiah is here already. They're planning the third temple. They've got the red heifers. They're, they have everything in place. And God's full attention will be back on them. And their eyes will be opened. 
the scales will fall from their eyes. Uh, they're only blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And then they turn to him during the tribulation, during Jacob's trouble. So after this, Jesus will return as king of kings, and he's going to reign and shepherd Israel. Peace only comes when the prince of peace returns and set, sets up his kingdom. And so, you know, here we're told that, um, you know, blessed are those who pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we should all always pray for Israel, and we should always pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And understand that Jerusalem will not see real peace until the Prince of Peace returns. And so when you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you are praying for Jesus to return. So the final thought here is, is Romans 11 is exactly that, that we are, we are seeing this time here between the end of the time of the Gentiles and the beginning of Jacob's trouble, the beginning of the tribulation period. I do not want you believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, to be unaware of this mystery. This is, and this is the mystery that was previously hidden because the rapture of the church is, is actually all throughout the Old Testament as well, but it's hidden. It's in types and shadows and pictures of the Gentile bride, but it's there. So that you will not be wise in your own opinion, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel. And it's, going to last until the full number of the Gentiles have come in. And so we're still waiting on some of our brothers and sisters to receive Jesus and come into the bride before the rapture of the church. And it's all going to be in God's perfect timing. He has his perfect, perfect timing. He knows exactly when that will be the fullness of time. In the fullness of time, Jesus came the first time. And in the fullness of time, the rapture will happen. And in the fullness of time, Jesus is going to return that second time and set up his millennial reign. But God hasn't left us in the dark on all of that either, because Jesus' first coming was exactly at that 4,000 years. He came at the fourth millennium, 4,000 years from Adam, he came just like he was told, just like we were told he was going to come. And we're told in scripture that after two days, on the third day, he raises us up. And so we know there's 6,000 years to man. That 7,000 year is the millennial reign of Christ. And time has been lost. We don't know exactly how close we are to that 6,000 but it's very, very close. And so we know as we're seeing all of these things come about, we see the day approaching. And so what does God tell us to do as we see the day approaching? We are supposed to encourage one another. We're supposed to pay attention to these things that we're seeing. As we're seeing the signs, literally the signs in the sky, we're seeing the birth pain signs. We're seeing all these things build and come together we are to be encouraged, not fearful, but to keep looking up and be encouraged that we're so blessed to live at a time like this. And so that was Revelation 12 and the redemption of our bodies.